Okay, welcome everyone to our second Southern New England Grower webinar of the season. We'll give folks a few minutes to start joining. But we're, yeah, people are joining right along. And I see Kelly and I'm going to promote to panelists. So we had quite a few people register for this event, I think close to 300. So we did have to go with this webinar format. So unfortunately, everyone's not able to share their video and unmute themselves quite as easily, but it's uh, just because we have a lot, of, a lot of people on the line. So um, this allows things to run a little smoothlier, if that's a word. Um, so we have 115 people so far uh, for today's webinar, which will be on winter greens, mostly spinach. Um, and we'll hear a lot about spinach downy mildew, which is an emerging disease in our region. With some experts online all the way from Arkansas. So it's fun, this online format has some benefits, even though it would be certainly much more fun if we could all be in the high tunnel looking at all the spinach varieties together. Um, but uh, I think with that, I'm gonna just go ahead and get started. Jim, if you want to share your screen. Do you so, wanna talk about pesticide credits before we start? Or? Or that is a good idea. Um, a yeah, lot of you requested yeah. pesticide credits and um, we should have your uh, information if you provided that during the registration. Um, so all you need to do is stay for the whole webinar and at the end there will be a quiz and you need to answer the quiz questions and um, we'll have a record of that and we'll send you a scanned copy of um, your pesticide credit form at the end. Um, there were a few issues last time. Um, people uh, didn't find the email, it went to your spam box. So if you were expecting a credit and didn't get it, do check your spam box. And if you don't see it there, then just send us an email. You can email umassveg at umass.edu and we'll get it squared away for you. So with that, if you want to go ahead and share your slides, Jim. So uh, Jim Carell is a plant pathologist at University of Arkansas. And he works closely with uh, the big spinach growers in California. Um, and so we're really glad to have him and one of his students, Kelly, here to talk about spinach downy mildew. Take it away. All right. Uh, thank you, Sue and uh, jean viev I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk to a, a pretty diverse group. I'm not sure exactly who's participating, but um, <clears throat> my understanding is it's pretty diverse. So as, if people have questions during the presentation, I'd be happy to address them as it comes up or, or um, after we're finished giving a presentation, whatever format you feel would be best. But um, I'll give you a little bit of experience based on my uh, work. I'm a plant pathologist, so I work on diseases of a wide range of crops, but spinach has been a specialty for maybe the last uh, 30 years or so, primarily on downy mildew spinach. So I'll give you my perspective. I was fortunate to uh, visit uh, Sue and jean uh, uh, well, it was uh, two years ago, I guess, to take a look at some of the production there and some of the issues people were having. So some experience, but not a lot, but I'll give you at least my perspective on, uh, on what we've been doing. And a number of you have received, uh, sent us isolates that we received from various parts of the East Coast, and I'll talk a little bit about them in a few minutes. <clears throat> But uh, before I get started, I'd like to um, at least recognize some of the people that uh, do more or less the, the heavy lifting. I'm trying to do my, uh, my pen here, sorry. For some reason, I can't use my laser pointer, so I'll have to just use my, uh, my cursor. Dr. Uh, Chunda Fang here, can you see my cursor, Sue, and everything on the screen? We okay. can, yes. <clears throat> and also a few other people currently in the lab, Pauline, 
sorry, Pauline, Maria, and Hannah, and Datsun are all working on some aspects of spinach. So uh, they're doing a lot of the work. If some of you corresponded with my lab, you probably have interacted with uh, Dr. Chundafeng quite a bit on some of the isolates we've been processing. So basically the way I've outlined my talk is to talk a little bit about the history of spinach, maybe more than some of you are probably interested in, but it, I think it'll give you some perspective on how the industry really has changed pretty dramatically over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. And then talk a little bit about my experience, West Coast production versus East Coast production and some of the major differences. And a little bit about the biology of spinach as well as the downy mildew pathogen. And that gives you some perspective on the challenges of trying to manage uh, downy mildew on spinach. And then of course, a lot of the race work that we've been doing, characterizing which strains attack which varieties and finish up talking about some of the management strategies to try to uh, manage uh, downy mildew on spinach. So uh, initially the history of the crop and some changes in production and consumption. The US produces about two and a half percent of the global spinach market. And that sounds rather small compared to the 90% or so in China but it still represents a large market. It's about a $500 million industry in the United States with a large portion of that uh, for fr fresh market production and a little bit for frozen and canned spinach. So um, I don't like to talk about spinach without talking a little bit about Popeye and some of the references with regard to spinach is Many people, although younger people aren't, don't get a chance to see these comics as much as they do in the U.S. as they do in other countries, but most of us at a certain age at least have seen uh, Popeye commercials. And there's a, I could give you a whole seminar about Popeye and the connection and what's going on with the history of that, but I'll give the short version here just so you have some idea about the origin of it. And and some of the initial reports of spinach indicated spinach was exceptionally high in iron. And spinach is very high in iron, but the re first reports indicated that it was actually 10 times higher than it was. It was a misplaced decimal point. So as a result, eating spinach made you stronger, but also back in the 20s and 30s, um, spinach was a code word for marijuana. And if you look in some of the older literature, some of the older jazz songs there have references to spinach and it's a metaphor for smoking marijuana. So there's a lot of uh, uh, connections with uh, Popeye and the association with marijuana, including the phrase that most of you are familiar with from the comic, I am what I am, which is a reference to uh, when, when God was talking to Moses through the burning bush, a lot of people speculate the burning bush was a burning marijuana plant, but we don't know the details. There's a lot of urban lore associated with spinach and marijuana. But anyway, spinach and Popeye became the first branded spinach product and obviously made it a pretty popular vegetable. The person that invented the character was actually a, a, a very staunch vegetarian. He was uh, well ahead of his time. This is back in the late thirties and early forties but he wanted to promote eating spinach as a, as a healthier way um, to live your life. But he was a little bit too ahead of his time because he also thought that smoking was healthy for you as well, which is why Popeye is smoking the you know, pipe in, in, a, in the cartoons. And now what he was smoking, uh, there's a lot of speculation associated with that as well. But anyway, in terms of the changes in the uh, product, most of you, if not all of you have seen in grocery stores nowadays, there are all these value added products, fresh products mixed, mixed with different lettuces and different leafy greens, selling for a premium price uh, throughout most grocery stores in the US and also even through the European Union. So again, these are all uh, triple wash products. They're a nice product. They're popular with consumers as opposed to when I was pretty young eating spinach, you almost ate more sand and dirt associated with the spinach than you ate spinach at the time. So it's a much better product and it's really greatly increased consumption. And of course, there's a lot of uh, fancy uh, 
uh, uh, spinach salads that you see all over the place. Uh, there's spinach has been used in tortilla chips. And I even had the opportunity to eat some spinach ice cream at a meeting or a year or two ago, which was rather interesting to say the least. Not too bad though. But anyway, the dramatic changes that happened in the late 80s and early 90s, spinach used to be grown about 50,000 to maybe 100,000 plants per acre. It was hand harvested and bunched. So it was a, a very low uh, uh, scale production. And that's been changed dramatically with the advent. Tanamir and Annal first started growing these large lawns or so of spinach. Oftentimes these fields have up to, instead of 100,000 plants per acre, have up to four or five million plants per acre, very dense. Um, very uh, high inputs, mechanically harvested, sprinkle irrigated. So all of these changes, these, this great increase in production and density of plants has really dramatically influenced disease pressure. As you can see, wet plants, high uh, density crop, very conducive to a number of diseases, including downing mildew of spinach. And this, uh, this uh, trend on uh, x-axis is the year of production and the total production on the y-axis. And you can see that there's uh, been tremendous increases in production since the late 80s or early 90s. And that corresponds with the increase in downing mildew pressure as well, which I'll get to in a minute. Again, mechanically harvested, very intensive production. It's a field in Texas, uh, a three-row harvester, which is um, uh, uh, pretty impressive in terms of the amount of spinach that can be harvested within an hour period of time. And as a result of this uh, greatly increased plant population, we're seeing a lot of diseases becoming a problem with downy mildew probably being the preeminent problem on spinach almost anywhere spinach is grown in the world. As I mentioned, it's a high value crop, about $500 million total in the United States about 50% of the production is organic production, certified organic ground and certified organic practices. And about, it, it depends on the year and, and, uh, and which races are predominating, but about 50% of the organic crop, it's been estimated, are lost on a yearly basis as a result of downy mildew, either affecting the yield or quality or both where you can't harvest the crop and, and and, and sell the crop due to the level of uh, uh, downy mildew that's present. So just real briefly, I'll go into some of the production aspects, East Coast, West Coast and East Coast. I mentioned a few things about the uh, West Coast. Again, very intensive production. These uh, uh, typically 32 rows are planted on, a, on an 80 inch bed. Um, you can see the 80 inch beds here. So very high plant population densities mechanically harvested and oftentimes harvested within about 25 days from the time the plants, the seed is put in the ground until it's harvested. And most of this production is either in the Salinas area, the central coast of California, or the Yuma area down on the Mexico border and Arizona. If you're eating fresh spinach now, at least from some of the larger retail stores, there's probably a 98% chance or so that it's coming from these areas down in, in the Yuma, Arizona area. If I could find my cursor right in this area. So very large scale production for uh, commercial retail spinach. And uh, as I mentioned, I had an opportunity to visit with, uh, with Sue and uh, jean uh two years ago to look at some of the production in the high tunnels. Actually very impressive production and very high quality spinach harvested a little bit later than typical production on, uh, on the West Coast. And again, probably not as dense, but also hand harvested and taken care of a little bit better. My feeling is that spinach that goes through this colder period, actually to me, and maybe it's only me, tends to taste a lot better than spinach that doesn't have that freeze on it. So I don't know if that's some of your experience or not, but it certainly seems to be a tastier product. And again, some typical production and uh, under the tunnel houses or the high tunnels. And I assume, Sue, that most of the growers that are participating, this is similar production practices to what they're following. Is that right? Okay, thanks. 
And again, in Yuma, Arizona, this time of the year, it's normally about 75 degrees. So this was quite a change to see spinach production under these conditions in, a, in Massachusetts two years ago. But it was interesting to see how well the spinach was doing, even under these conditions that where the, where the tunnel houses are not heated and uh, under some pretty adverse conditions. And again, I was very impressed with the product and how it tasted and also how much uh, the product would sell for in some of these uh, truck market type stores. It was actually pretty, uh, pretty impressive. And again, as a result of that visit, uh, we typically do a variety trial that I'll talk about in a minute in uh, both Yuma, Arizona and Salinas, California, and talking with Sue and uh, jean Viev about maybe taking a subset of, that, of those varieties and see how they might perform under cooler conditions in the East Coast. That kind of started the relationship with trying to grow some different varieties that might be beneficial for growers on the, on the East Coast. So I have a number of pictures here. I think, Sue, you have a number probably that you might want to share. But in addition to the variety trial, looking at mildew, we did see a number of other disorders. Uh, spinach doesn't like a lot of uh, wet conditions and, and fertilizer conditions. So with spinach, one of the good things about working on it is there's always something going on, even if it's not a disease problem. There's all these challenges in growing spinach. So I'll talk a little bit about the biology of spinach downy mildew and spinach itself, and it'll give some perspective on how this disease is managed with hybrid spinach varieties. Um, so uh, again, spinach is not related to cannabis, but it's very similar in the breeding process in that there's male plants and female plants that are on, they're separate from one another. So if you look on this right panel, this is a typical hybrid spinach production field in Denmark. In the center here are the, uh, the female lines. And you can see, and you can't, on, on this side are the male lines. So they grow the female lines, they're pollinated by the male lines. And the primary, there are two reasons that this is primarily done. One is, the primary driving reason is to uh, combine the genetics of the male and the female for resistance to downy mildew. A lot of these genes are, are closely linked and you, through traditional breeding, you can't combine these different sorts of resistance, but using hybrid production, you can. And about 85% of all the spinach seed that's grown in the United States is actually produced in Denmark or the Pacific Northwest of the United States because Spinach needs long days to get it to flower under moderate temperatures and, these, and both in Denmark and the Pacific Northwest, the large bodies of water buffer the temperature so it never gets too hot where you have these long day uh, periods in the summertime. So I want to give an example of say uh, uh, hybrids. I know some people have a question about what's going on with the resistance. And I, I just put an example up here in the male, or you see where the male plant is in the female. And the resistance differs depending on what R gene is in the male and female. By R gene, I mean resistance gene to the downy mildew pathogen. So for example, in this case, the male parent carries resistance to one to 10, and the female carries resistance to a number of other races, but you could see that it has, it has holes, for example, for some races. But when you combine the, uh, combine the two parents, if I can go back here, um, you get a complement of the resistance from both the female. But in this case, you could see that it has a, a hole for the resistance to 13. So when you see uh, uh, downy mildew on plants and spinach on the East Coast, it could be due that the combination of resistance that there's a hole for that particular race that's attacking your plants. It could be that there's a novel strain that's overcoming uh, the resistance in the combined resistance in the inbred, or it could be that you have inbred plants that an inbred plant is when the female can, it has an unusual characteristic. It can go through what's called a sex reverse where the female plant can produce some pollen and fertilize itself. And if that happens, it does not pick up the resistance from the male parent. So it's not a hybrid, it's an inbred line. And typically this in the field, you'll see random plants scattered in the field as opposed to an isolate that's overcoming the resistance. You'll get a hot spot where you have a cluster of plants that all have uh, 
have mildew, if, if that's clear. So the combinations of the two parents is what dictates the overall resistance. So if you look at a typical seed catalog, in this case, uh, kookaburra is the, is the variety. It's an F1, meaning it's a hybrid. And it lists the resistance down here to the various races. And you can see that it has a hole for race 14. And you can also see it has high resistance. You'll see some catalogs, although they're not supposed to do that, they'll report intermediate resistance or field resistance to a, a given race of the downy mildew pathogen. So with that, um, I'll go on a little bit with, uh, and don't feel that, you know, you're doing something wrong when you're growing spinach, spinach or uh, getting downy mildew on spinach. I've seen downy mildew, I think, in over 35 countries now. It's a big problem wherever spinach is grown. It's a global pathogen. It's an obligate OMIC pathogen, meaning it has to complete its life cycle on spinach. It doesn't go to any other hosts that we're aware of. And it's favored by cool and wet weather, but it also has a wide temperature range where it could do quite well. And uh, in, in the picture up in the middle here in the center is Nepal. This is, I think, about 14,000 foot elevation in the foothills of, of the Himalaya Mountains. Um, no other commercial agriculture, and yet they still had downing mildew in their farmers markets and on their spinach. In Egypt, as an example, it was about 115 degrees Fahrenheit, and we found mildew in a spinach field, and even went to uh, where the seed was being produced and sold to look at perhaps if, uh, if there was seed-borne uh, inoculum to see if that maybe was the origin of, uh, of the outbreak of the downy mildew. But just very briefly, um, the pathogen goes through a quick six to eight life, uh, day life cycle under favorable conditions. It produces asexual spores that can blow in the wind and travel pretty long distances and infect tissue. One thing that we don't have a very good handle on is the O spores. We know that O spores, these are dormant sexual spores, are there. How important they are in terms of infecting and initiating epidemics we're trying to address through another project that Dr. Kelly Clark will talk about in a minute, but it certainly has been a challenge to try to tease apart that aspect of the epidemiology of this important pathogen. These are the oospores, the dormant structures that you can find on seed and often are in soil that have to ripen up over a period of time. This is a schematic uh, diagram of the disease cycle of the pathogen produced by uh, Dr. Steve Klosterman's lab. Uh, Kelly is working in Steve's lab in Salinas on this joint project addressing some of these more complicated uh, epidemiology questions. And I won't go through the details, but again, we're trying to uh, sort out exactly how important some of the OO spores are for initiating epidemics. But we do know that green bridges, other crops, other uh, spinach, uh, material, volunteers, and gardens, that all these can be sources of potential asexual inoculum to perpetuate and initiate the disease. Um, in addition, I mentioned about spores blowing around, asexual spores. These green bridges we know are critical in California because spinach is grown almost all year long. Well, it is in the field 12 months out of the year in, in California. So we know these older crops can ha harbor spores that can blow onto the newer crops. So that's certainly an issue. We also know that moving product can move the spores around where they can get airborne and uh, get on the crop. And also FedEx, although we don't necessarily have proof of this, we know that when new strains of this pathogen show up, it's surprising how quickly they end up in a breeder's uh, a laboratory in Europe or some other part of the country, others, other part of the world, where they're screening for disease resistance. And uh, before, when I first started working on downy mildew, it was very common I would go to the grocery stores to get our isolates of downy mildew off of the spinach that they weren't putting on the shelf because it would have so much mildew. It was a lot cheaper, but not as much as fun to travel to in the locations to get the samples. But certainly these aspects are involved in influencing the movement of the pathogen. I'm just going to go through some slides real quickly. This is an example of severe mildew in the, some fields in Yuma, Arizona. There they actually have mildew crews that will go out, in this case, 
you might see 50 to 100 people out there culling out the infected leaves so it doesn't end up in the harvested product to, to knock down. If it's up above usually two or three percent, the grower can't typically sell that crop. So they'll have crews go out and everywhere you see a hole here is where there's been a hot spot of mildew where they've had to remove the leaves before harvest. So um, I just wanted to talk real briefly then about how we identify races, which probably most people are interested in if you're growing spinach. When we get an isolate either sent to us or collected, it oftentimes is about a one to three month endeavor till we sort some things out. So even though it's easy to collect the isolate, we don't have, we can tell you in 30 seconds whether it's downy mildew, but unlike the COVID virus, we can't tell you in one or two days, you know, what particular strain we're working with. So we have to do a bioassay. The bioassay is anywhere to one to two weeks long, and we have to do it multiple times to sort out what's going on. So it's a very labor intensive process. We inoculate a set of spinach differentials that have different genetics. And based on those reactions, we could race type the strain that might be showing up in your field. And we typically try to verify these uh, races as we nominate them with groups around the world to see if we're all seeing the same reactions on the same genetics. But I won't go into too much detail on that. This just very briefly is a, a list of some of the germplasm that we use. Here's the variety on the top, the race on, uh, on, on this axis here. And based on the reaction, we could tell whether it's race 14 or 17 or something novel. If we get a reaction that doesn't fit this pattern, it's typically a novel isolate. And we try to sort out whether that it's an important novel isolate, meaning does it show up more than once? Is it in different geographical locations? How big of a problem is it? So we do that testing. And this kind of ex an example of what we've seen in the last 20 or 30 years, this curve of the races that we're identifying on spinach follows that progression of increased production of uh, spinach, particularly on the West Coast of the United States. So when you're throwing a lot of genetics, a lot of new germplasm at this pathogen, you're putting a lot of selection pressure on it to change. And hence, you're actually selecting for races that can overcome the resistance in that hybrid spinach. Um, I won't go over too much detail, but this is a summary of some of the results if some of the growers, I put my email and my phone number if they want to contact me individually about isolates we've run from them. But we have about five isolates that have typed out as race 12 over the last couple of years, two isolates as race 14. And we do have a number of isolates, about 11, that fit within about six different novel types. By novel types, they have subtle differences uh, on the reactions on some of the germplasm, but nothing that's overcoming all of the known resistance. So there still should be some germplasm, some genetics that should hold up to some of the strains that are kicking around on the East Coast. And I could come back to that in a minute. Um, this is just uh, the individual isolates. And you can see we have them from New York, Massachusetts, Maine, Connecticut, down to Maryland. So we think we have a fairly representative idea of what's going on in terms of samples coming in from the East Coast. Um, and I won't go into too much detail, but this gives you an example of what we're seeing with some of these isolates that we've typed with the race or phenotype uh, on, on the right in the right hand column of that table. Um, I'll skip over this. These are the detailed reactions of what we're seeing with some of these uh, races. And again, we're working on two isolates that may be nominated as race 18 and 19. And the way this works is if we agree that um, depending on how common these strains are and if other people are seeing and other laboratories are seeing the same reactions, we go through a whole protocol with the Dutch group under the plantum umbrella to say we should nominate this as race 18 and there's a press release in Europe and in the US. So everybody's on the same uh, page in terms of what we're calling these variants that are attacking spinach. And I'll just finish up uh, just talking a few minutes about um, uh, some of the management practices. Basically, the management practice that I recommend everybody is don't put all your eggs in one basket, meaning try to try to combine your different genetics with different resistances when you're planning out different varieties. 
So if you do have mildew show up and it's conducive that you're not going to lose all of your crop and that some of the genetics would hold up. Um, this is just a diagram. I'm, I'm basically somewhere in the middle here in terms of public research personnel. And there's a lot of entities that are involved in funding this work and evaluating the work. The California Leafy Greens Research Board, California Seed Association, private industry in terms of seed production companies and seed distribution companies, and also in the Europe uh, and, and the EU and the Netherlands. And this plantum group that I mentioned, there's a group called the International Working Group on Paranospora, where we meet every, as a matter of fact, we're meeting next week, where we meet and say what isolates or what strains are prevalent in different parts of the world, what new resistances would be most effective to the spectrum of the uh, pathogen virulence that's out there. So uh, the majority of uh, uh, the way this disease is controlled is by major or qual qualitative resistance, meaning if it's resistance to race 14, you don't get any infection. It's completely immune to that particular race. The problem, as I mentioned, is a lot of these major genes have holes. So even combining the male and female resistance, sometimes you don't have complete resistance. And even when you do, you may select a strain that's overcoming all the known resistance in that particular variety. There is some uh, minor resistance, meaning quant quantitative resistance, where one variety might uh, develop the disease a little slower than another variety. Crop rotation is very important, not only in terms of uh, uh, downy mildew, but other diseases. But I, I do believe that some of these oospores are getting in the fields and they're ripening over time that can initiate some of these epidemics. So I, I know some of these tunnel houses are not movable, but anything that could be done to rotate would be helpful. Green bridges, any volunteer plants, any crop, older crop that's near a younger plant, we should try to avoid that to keep inoculum from moving over to uh, your younger crop. Um, I assume most of the growers you're dealing with, Sue and Genbiev, is uh, are organic growers. Is that the case? Yeah, okay. a lot of the winter spinach is grown yeah. organically. Uh, there are some effective conventional materials, but I, I won't go into them. From an organic standpoint, we've looked at some 50 different products. None of them seem to work from a commercial standpoint, at least under West Coast production. Some of the coppers can reduce the... Uh, the uh, disease a little bit, but they leave a residue. So it's certainly not too uh, appetizing for the consumer. So most growers avoid that. We've looked at a few biologicals as well, and they have not been effective, at least in our hands, in reducing disease to any significant level. Just finish up talking a little bit about these trials that we do. We do trials in Yuma, Arizona and, and Salinas. We typically put out 70 contemporary varieties from the various companies for them to evaluate, see, we score these for downing mildew to see what's a, what's a, a problem, what races are prevalent in that area, what varieties hold up best. And again, Sue and Genevieve, these are su a subset of some of the things that you guys are looking at for vigor under your conditions as well as uh, downing mildew. And we also do biofungicide tests to evaluate these. As a matter of fact, we'll have a field day. I think it'll be the 24th of February if anyone's interested in getting out of cold weather and coming to uh, Yuma to see some spinach and you don't mind traveling with the, with the restrictions that are out there. Um, but I'll, I'll let you know about that. But we have that every year in February and October, we have a field day in Salinas. But this gives you the spectrum of what we typically see with a lot of these varieties. We see highly susceptible, intermediate, and depending on what uh, race might be prevalent, sometimes we see varieties that are completely um, a devoid of the disease and completely immune to what's at, out there under natural field infection. Um, I'll just briefly mention, we have a spinach website. It's, if you Google spinach portal, it has information a little bit. We certainly don't keep it up to date as much as I'd like to because of the personnel that we don't, we don't really have personnel to take care of this website. But we have updated it with some recent meetings. We're, we have an international spinach conference Every uh, other year or so uh, until COVID hit, we had a meeting planned for uh, Australia this past May that got canceled. But uh, I don't know, some of you may know uh, Richard Raid down at Bell Glade in, in Florida. 
but his group has agreed to host a meeting. It's tentative, but it'll be a year from now in Belle Glade. And the following year, we'll have the meeting in Australia. If anybody's interested, and I certainly could, could keep you updated, uh, Sue and Genevieve, about uh, what's going on with that. So with that, um, again, I'd like to thank the whole team for doing the work. If you have some questions, I know I probably went a little bit long with uh, my time there. Um, but no, you're we, actually good, but... Um, okay, if, uh, if you don't mind, and maybe if, if there's time for Kelly to say a few words, and then we could open it up for questions if anybody has any about some of the things that we covered, okay? Yeah. Um, are you yeah, maybe to... while Kelly's getting her slides up, um, while well, Jim, first you stop sharing your slides and we could answer a few questions while, while you get set up, Kelly. There's a lot of good questions coming, coming okay. in. I'm let so... you prioritize them. So I can't look at the questions. Yeah, anymore. yeah, don't, don't try. Um, so you talked about how long it takes to um, do the race typing. Yes. Um, are scientists working on a more efficient method to identify the races? Um, we have a number of molecular projects that have targeted racing, IDing things based on a molecular basis. It's an uphill challenge um, that we have some markers that indicate there might be some correlation, but at this point in time, there's not a, a molecular marker for race typing. If we get good, at, so we rely on the bioassay. If we get really good inoculum from the field, we can typically inoculate the differentials and within a one week period of time, get a good idea, but it still takes seven days to complete that bioassay. We wish there was a faster method. We worked on a couple aspects of it, but as of now, there's no quicker way to do it. Okay, maybe one more question. Um... Could other kinopods serve as a green bridge or is spinach the only crop affected by this disease? Um, based on the literature and our experience, spinach is the only crop where uh, that this particular pathogen attacks. We've gotten other kinopodium weeds from the field that have actually had downy mildew, try to do the cross inoculations on the spinach and have not been able to demonstrate that. We've taken spinach inoculum and tried to inoculate a wide range of kinopodium hosts, and we have not been able to, to get them infected. So at least all of the data indicate that spinach is the only host of this particular downy mildew pathogen. Okay, so then the source of the initial inoculum is it, it could be, uh, in my opinion, at least in the West Coast where you have spinach 12 months of the year, it's almost certainly coming from an older crop or older product in the area. You can have uh, volunteer plants. I don't know about in these tunnel houses whether there's any volunteer plants that come up. Local gardens that may be uh, where the plants are surviving for a longer period of time could certainly be uh, a potential source. And of course, oospores on seed are, there have been studies where it's been shown that these spores can infect a low percentage of plants. Those uh, experiments we have not been able to repeat, but that dormant oospore, if it's ripe enough, theoretically can germinate and initiate an epidemic. How important that is on either the East Coast or West Coast is still a, a tough question to answer from an epidemiology standpoint. Well, that's a great segue to Kelly's um, question, our presentation. There are really a lot of great questions coming in and I would just say, keep them coming. If we aren't able to get them all answered today, um, we'll, we'll send out um, the answers as, a, as an email after the workshop. Um, some of your questions might be answered by Kelly and Jean-Viev who are gonna speak next. So go ahead, Kelly, thanks. Hi everyone, I don't know if you can see my slides correctly. Do they look okay? Okay, good. Um, I'm Kelly and I'm a postdoc uh, joint between Jim Carell's lab and Steve Klosterman's lab. So technically I work for the University of Arkansas, but I'm located at the USDA ARS station in Salinas, California. Uh, so that's why the pictures of me are not with the lab, it's separated <laughs> from the lab. Uh, so you have to crop me in there. Uh, but I just wanted to give a quick overview of some of the projects I'm working on in the lab um, and what we're doing to kind of understand these disease outbreaks. Oops. 
So my project objectives are to one, develop standardized tests to quantify Piafusa inoculum in the soil, plants, and crop debris. Um, I think somebody did ask a question about if we're working on developing tests that are more efficient for determining the races. And not at this point, we don't have any quick tests that can differentiate a race. I mean, that would be great. <laughs> um, but um, one thing we are looking into is just if we could kind of fingerprint different races, uh, genetically fingerprint them to see if they're, or not races, um, isolates, to see if they're similar to isolates we've previously characterized. So that's one project that we have going. Um, my second objective is to determine the, the importance of different inoculum sources in outbreaks. Um, so like Jim presented, there's both sexual and asexual spore types. So we know that the sporangia, the asexual spores can germinate and uh, cause disease, but we're not so sure about the oospores, the sexual spores, or other potentially infectious propagules such as mycelia or those green bridges or things that could be in the soil. And then my third major objective is to examine these first two objectives in both commercial fields and research plots. Um, so Jim already showed the life cycle for Paranospora fusa. So like I mentioned, we know that these asexual spores, the sporangia, are windborne and they can land on the leaf surface, germinate and lead to the uh, disease symptoms and signs that we recognize. Um, but what we know a lot less about are the sexual oospores and if they're able to germinate and infect spinach leading to different epidemics. Um, and in this case, there would be, you know, chances of new emerging races because there would be more availability for genetic recombination. And in addition to looking at if O spores can lead to disease, we also want to look at mycelia. So if mycelia can remain dormant somehow and possibly be infectious material. So for sporangia, just to give you an idea of some of the experiments we've been doing, previously we looked at desiccation of sporangia on hard surfaces. And if you desiccate the spores for even 24 hours, you can drastically reduce their germination and these spores were unable to initiate disease. So currently I am working on expanding these studies by looking at sporangia desiccation on the leaf surface, which is more realistic to the natural environment. So if I cut leaves that have heavy spore infestation and let them desiccate, um, right now I can see that after about four days you get a pretty drastic reduction in sporangia germination, but there's still the capability of these spores to initiate disease, although at a lower level. And so I'm investigating further, you know, what is the time point in between four days and 14 days where the spores lose viability and also in different conditions because, you know, outside um, where there's more heat or light can affect the sporangia viability as well. And so, like I said, we also want to know if oospores or mycelia can serve as inoculum sources. So we are able to get oospores germinating in the lab, although not many. So when we do have them, we try to infect leaves, roots, and germinating spinach seedlings. Um, we have not yet been able to complete an infection cycle from doing this, but we're trying different angles to see, you know, what are those conditions that may be necessary for O spores to initiate and progress a whole downy mildew infection cycle. And then recently we're also adding testing mycelia to this. So in order to look at if mycelia are infectious, 
we would have to isolate them from the other tissues. So if we have a bunch of sporangia on the leaf surface, you know, can we scrape all of those off and just filter, filter them out so we have just the mycelia or could we use tissue before sporulation occurs where mycelia is in the leaf and see if that tissue is infectious. And so Jim also touched on potential um, seed transmission. So oospores have been found in spinach seeds. This is a picture of just hundreds of oospores. I don't know if you can see the tiny little circles um, and a single spinach seed. So we do look at different seed lots for the presence or absence of oospores and um, try to our best ability to quantify this. And if oospores are present, we assess their viability by putting them on water auger plates and seeing if they can germinate. And we have observed germination from uh, oospores found in seed lots, although at a very low level. And another way we can assess their viability is through plasmolysis tests. So this is just adding a really high concentration of salt to see if the plasma membrane is still intact. And so from testing these seed lots, we've picked a handful to um, further investigate in this contained system we have at the USDA Salinas location. So here in this picture, this is what we call an isolator. And this is a row of six of them and it's a contained little pod that gets filtered air and it has its own water system. And so we plant seed from different spinach seed lots in there. Um, that we can track that's not affected by any windborne potential inoculum to see if these plants get disease. And so right now I have six different seed lots in there. So we try to pick things that we've found to be both negative for oospores and positive for oospores and also uh, lots we've done PCR testing on. So we do see lots that are negative for oospores by microscope observations, but then positive by PCR. So, you know, that's telling us either our method is not showing us if there are O spores there or that there's something else there, which could be potentially mycelia um, or sporangia, which may or may not be viable. And so I'm currently monitoring these seedlots in the isolators. So just to show you a picture of what this looks like. It's been a little over two months now and we haven't observed any downy mildew symptoms on these six lots, um, but we're going to keep observing them because we have seen mildew on spinach seed lots grown in these isolators in the past. Um, but of course, there are still some other variables here such as, you know, resistance of the, of the variety um, and the age of the seed lots. And so some of the seed lots we're using now are a few years old. So, you know, another question remains as to if any and propicules in there are viable, how long, you know, after the seed lot ages, are they still viable? Um, so just to summarize and put some future directions, um, we're, we're working on a publication for a detection method for Piafusa and spinach leaves. Uh, this would not be race specific, just uh, in case anyone was wondering that. Um, and also, uh, you know, as I mentioned, looking at the importance of different inoculum sources. So this includes, again, the sporangia, the, the, which are the asexual spores, the oospores, the sexual spores, and mycelia. And, you know, trying different techniques to see if oospores and mycelia can infect spinach plants directly. And then continuing to monitor seed lots and look at these seed lots in the controlled isolator systems. And, you know, to date we have not conclusively demonstrated seedling infection um, with O spores, but again, we're still still working on it, and of course, we'll keep everyone updated with what we find. So, with that, I'll just That's go to great. my acknowledgement slide here. Um, can see Jim and I out in the field, hard at work. <laughs>
um, with our recognize the Razorback hat in case nobody. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly, for that research update. It's definitely a big question on our minds in the Northeast where we haven't really had this disease before. So now like, where is it coming from? Are we, are, do we have these O spores? Are they coming on the seed or is it surviving in, this, in the soil? And so it's good to know that someone's working on answering these questions and that we're connected with you so you can um, sort of help us solve this problem as it unfolds. Um, so next up we'll have Jean Biev who is going to talk about the variety trials that we've been doing in, in Massachusetts and I think she'll answer some of the questions that are coming in which are about which variety, which um, Jim shared what strains we've, we've detected so far here, um, but it's a lot of information so she'll share that again as well as some varieties um, that we've been looking at for the Northeast. Um, so if Sean, if you want to get your slides up there and um, yeah, we'll go through her, her slideshow and then we'll be sure to do a lot of, go through a lot of the questions, but hopefully she'll answer some of them for you here. Thanks. Great. Can yep, you see it looks that great. Too? Excellent. I'm going to hide your guys' faces. All right. Um, that was all amazing information, and I definitely learned a lot in the last 45 minutes, <laughs> as well as I'm sure everyone else listening. Um, my name is Jambiev Higgins. Um, I am an extension educator with the UMass Vegetable Program. Um, and as you said, I'm going to talk about some of the variety trials that we've been doing for the last few years, looking at um, winter spinach production in high tunnels. Um, and the kind of broader goal of these variety trials is to identify spinach varieties that have as broad a resistance as possible to spinach jenny mildew, um, but to find varieties that are adapted to the kind of unique winter growing system that we have um, in the Northeast. Um, so I won't talk a lot about the background of this pathogen because obviously Jim and Kelly just talked a lot about that. Um, but just to kind of bring it back to New England, um, we definitely see downy mildew in New England every year to some extent. Um, some years we don't get a lot of reports. Other years we get a lot of reports. Uh, this year we've had quite a few um, folks reporting downy mildew on their spinach. Um, and it can definitely result in full yield losses for some of our farms, um, which is a bummer. Um, so we, we kind of go through these ebb and flows of some years it feels like not that big of a deal and why are we thinking about it at all? Um, and then the next year we have tons of reports of this disease and we go, oh, right, of course, this is why we are paying attention to it because it's, uh, it's not great when it shows up on your farm. Um, so Jim talked a lot about all of this, but just to summarize, it's a tricky pathogen, this downy mildew pathogen, um, because there are these 17 strains of the pathogen. Um, and they each infect different, um, different varieties of spinach. Um, and as Jim said, over the last few years, we've seen outbreaks of race 12, 14, uh, 15, and then we have a um, maybe not fully confirmed 17 this year, um, and then also some novel strains. Um, and we usually see outbreaks um, or the outbreaks are determined by the gaps in resistance. So if you have a variety that is susceptible to race 13 and race 13 is around, you'll get downy mildew. Um, so it's definitely tempting um, to, grow, uh, to grow varieties that are resistant to the race that showed up last year or the race that you heard was in the area last year. Um, but any strain can show up anytime. And if, you, if there's a novel strain around, we don't necessarily know what varieties they're going to pop up on. So as Jim said, definitely the best recommendation for avoiding downy mildew is always grow several varieties that have different gaps in resistance so that all your eggs aren't in one basket. Um, and in New England, we definitely see downy mildew most um, in the cooler seasons. So we see it in the field in fall and spring crops. Um, and we see it in the winter in high tunnels. Um, 
that was very interesting to learn from Jim that it'll pop up in Egypt in, in over 100 degree weather. Um, we don't see it a lot in the summer out here, so I'm not sure why. Um, we definitely see it mostly in the spring, fall, and winter. Um, and then another big piece of, um, of our work out here is thinking about uh, variety availability. Um, so as has been said already, uh, companies are constantly developing new varieties of spinach to kind of keep up with this evolving pathogen. Um, a lot of the like best and brightest varieties with the most resistance to downy mildew are targeted towards the big California and Arizona growers. We don't always have access to them out here um, where relatively our production is much, much smaller. Um, so it's just another kind of piece of the puzzle. And I know there's a bunch of uh, people from the seed industry on the webinar right now. So if you have comments about that, if things are changing, if you have anything to add, please put comments in the chat box and it would be great to hear from you. <clears throat> so hold on a moment and drink, drink some water. So for the last three years, we have been trialing spinach varieties um, and trying to find some ones with broad resistance that do well out here. Um, before I jump into talking about some of the trials, I'll say that we grow our spinach um, in an unheated tunnel, no supplemental heat. Um, it's, it has a double layer of plastic. And we have overhead irrigation in there. Just get some of that out of the way. Um, our trials have had a similar setup over the last three years. Um, in the first year of trials, uh, we tested 15 varieties um, and we seeded October 26, which is pretty late in the spinach seeding window for our region. Um, and we seeded pretty thinly. We were putting down 15 seeds per square foot. Um, and as with every year, we rated germination um, as well as plot vigor, um, which is kind of a generalized parameter that takes into account um, stand as well as plant size, um, any yellowing that's going on, um, as well as regrowth quality after we've harvested. Um, and then we collect harvest weight data. Um, and one thing that is, has been a constant over the last three years um, is that the, the performance of each of the varieties has really varied over the, uh, over the three years. So for example, um, uh, if you look at this graph over here, this is looking at plot vigor from this year. Um, a small caveat with this figure is that all of the starred varieties were actually, by the time we did this trial, they were already not available from the producers. So ignore all the starred <laughs> varieties there. Um, but Rigor and Kiowa um, did pretty well in this 2018 trial. Um, and here's some pictures of those guys. There's Rigor and Kiowa, which were both one through 17 varieties. Um, uh, but the next year in the 2019 trial, they really did not do well at all. Um, and then Nevada also did fairly well in the first year of trials and did pretty well last year as well. Um, and we've included it in this year's trial, but it's kind of in the middle of the pack or middle bottom of the pack for this year. So every year there's slightly different environmental conditions. Um, we switched up some of our seeding techniques from between the first and second year. So maybe that had something to do with it. But it's always interesting to see the differences in a variety from one year to the next. Um, moving on to last year's trial, which was the 2019 trial, we tested 32 varieties, which was a lot in our one little high tunnel. <laughs> um, we seeded a little earlier. We seeded um, between October 7th and 10th, and we seeded much more densely at 70 seeds per square foot. And that came from a per acre seeding rate um, from Jim, from uh, a lot of the big California and Arizona growers. Um, so much more dense. Again, we rated germination, um, vigor, and, and harvest weight. We also started measuring damping off um, so damping off is a disease complex that's caused by um, pythium and rhizoctonia in the soil. And those fungi or fungal-like organisms um, will kill the seeds either as they're germinating before they come out of the soil. That's pre-emergent damping off. 
um, or after the seed has fully germinated um, and it'll kill it at that point and that's post-emergent damping off. So we look at that as well. And then we switched up our harvesting technique last year um, and uh, harvested just each variety um, as it became mature, um, as opposed to, I think I forgot to say this, but last year, the first year of trials, we harvested every variety one time at the same time. So some of them were quite large, some of them were just barely ready to be harvested. Um, but last year we harvested each variety whenever it was ready. So varieties were harvested between one and three times with the earliest harvest um, happening on December 4th, which was eight weeks after seeding. Um, and the latest harvest would have happened on March 11th if COVID hadn't hit, but we, were, we weren't able to access our tunnel because of the shutdowns from COVID. So we weren't actually able to collect full harvest, um, full harvest data from that year. This is just a taste of the data from last year. Um, as you can see, it's a lot of varieties and a lot of varieties that are kind of in this middle range of, of yeah, middle range. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, and I'll, uh, let's see, there were some varieties that, that performed pretty good across all of these parameters, the germination, the damping off, the vigor, uh, the harvest weight. So uh, this list of varieties are all ones that did fairly well. None of them was like, you know, the number one best, um, but a few that, that performed pretty well. Um, we had Cocopa and PV1526. Um, they're both one through 17 varieties. They both had um, this very nice, like dense growth habit with a lot of leaves per plant um, and nice lush growth. Um, Lorito was also fairly nice, pretty upright. Um, you can see in this picture, the leaves are getting a little bit deltoid, like a little bit funky looking. Um, I believe that all three of these pictures were after at least one or two harvests. So this is regrowth um, and they always get a little funky in their regrowth. Um, but Lirita was another nice one. Reflect was also a nice one. You can see nice lush growth here. Um, Reflect is not a one through 17 variety. So you can see it has a gap at 12 and a gap at 14, and it's not resistant to 17 either. Um, yep. So that brings us to our current trial. Um, where we are growing 18 varieties this year. Um, again, we seeded in mid-October, October 13th. Um, again, at that higher seeding rate, 70 seeds per square foot, um, and, have, and measuring all the same things, germination, damping off, bigger regrowth quality, harvest weight. Um, and we have harvested each variety once already. Um, that took place on two different dates. So the, the little bit faster varieties were harvested on December 22nd, which was 10 weeks after seeding. And then there was another group of a little slower varieties that were harvested on January 15th, which was 13 weeks after seeding. Um, and starting with the germination data, um, you'll notice here that platypus and viraflay are crossed out. That's just because they really didn't germinate at all, almost at all. Um, viraflay is a variety that doesn't have any downy mildew resistance. So it's in the trial as kind of a negative check um, in case the trial develops downy mildew. So it is maybe understandable that it didn't do great in 30 degree temperatures because <laughs> it's not bred for that. Um, uh, and once you kick platypus and veriflay out of the picture, there's no significant differences in the germination rates um, between all these varieties. But that said, there's definitely numerical differences. Um, and for a grower, 100% germination rate, like we see with Dracus or Crosstrek, um, is a totally different story than like a 60% germination rate on average, like we're seeing with Colibri. Um, so there might not be statistical differences here, but there's definitely a group that you know has more than 90% germination rates um, that stands out a little bit. And as I go through some of this, um, some more of this data. You'll see there's kind of, there's several varieties that are always kind of in this top group, a little bit of a fuzzy group, but, um, and, and I'll talk more about those varieties that are popping up um, in a little bit.
So um, as I said, we uh, are looking at damping off again this year. Um, and, uh, and we are rating post-emergent damping off. So for example, in this picture up here on the top, you can see that there's a bad stand. Their plants did not germinate. Um, and so we would give this a low germination rating um, compared to this picture down below where you can see there's lots of healthy plants, lots of plants germinated, um, but then there's also all of these plants that germinated and then were killed by Pythium or Rhizoctonia. Um, that's the damping off. So in this scenario down here below, this plot would probably have a high germination rating, but would also have a high damping off rating um, and low survival. So that's what this graph over here is showing. Um, and uh, again, there's a lot of varieties that are kind of in this middle ground area um, with a few varieties that are significantly better than the others, but definitely this group that's, you know, has more than 80% survival, um, which is pretty good. Um, and then on to yield. <clears throat> Um, as I said before, all the varieties have been harvested once um, with that harvest taking place on those two different dates. Um, this figure here is showing yield per square foot. Um, and one of the most interesting things from last year's trial wasn't necessarily the yield from a single harvest, but it, actually the number of harvests that we were able to get from each variety um, over the season. So some varieties were only harvested once last year, some were harvested three times. Um, so you can see Dracus and Sculptor are looking real good right now in this preliminary data. Um, and it'll be interesting to see as the season progresses if they regrow really fast and we're able to harvest them maybe three times before March, um, they'll probably stay in the top of the list. Or if some of these other um, maybe lower yielding varieties grow faster, they might kind of bump them out of place. Um, and then again, there's this kind of group that is maybe not statistically different, but is yielding more than 0.2 pounds per square foot. Um, and yeah, look pretty good. So with that, the, the best part of this field day, if we were all in person, probably wouldn't be us talking at your faces, um, but it would be you getting to walk through the tunnel <laughs> and see the varieties for yourself. Because um, everyone has their preferences. Some people like savoy leaf, some people like flat leaf, uh, and some people really need a very upright variety. Other people can deal with a more, a flatter variety. Um, so this is our online version of that, which is not quite as good, but pretty good. <laughs> um, I will draw your attention in this picture, if you can see my mouse, and maybe I can turn on my aha, laser pointer. Um, this variety right here is looking pretty lush, pretty nice. In this bed here, this guy is looking pretty good, pretty lush, fairly upright. And then over here, this one is also looking pretty good. Um, so those three varieties are Crosstrek, Patton, and Dallas. Um, and we'll look at them a little closer. Um, so those three, in addition to sculpt, oops, in addition to sculptor, which in that previous picture is on the other side of the tunnel, so I couldn't circle it. Um, <laughs> but these four varieties uh, all are looking pretty good so far in terms of having good germination, good survival, so low damping off, um, and relatively high uh, yields for that first harvest. Um, Crosstrek and Patton uh, have a kind of similar dense growth habit to them um, and these kind of slightly curly leaves. So like this leaf here, you can see is kind of curly. It's not necessarily savoyed a lot, but it's just curly, um, which is kind of cute in my opinion. Adds some nice body to the spinach. Uh, Dallas by comparison is more flat, which isn't great for a lot of um, our growers who are trying to harvest. Um, and then Sculptor is also kind of mid-range flat, not super upright, but not, you know, not like lying on the ground. Um, and you can see nicely in this picture, it's very dark green, which is nice. Um, and then Dallas, Crosstrek, and Sculptor are all 1 through 17 varieties. Uh, Patton is missing 16, so Patton is susceptible to 16. Um, and then these three varieties, 
Dallas Crosstrek and Patton were harvested on the first harvest date and December 22nd. Um, Sculptor was a little slower and was harvested on January 15th. And these are all pictures from their harvest dates. So we do harvest at a fairly small size. Um, yeah. Now, yeah, could you go back to one slide just real quick? I was just gonna ask you. In that third row, the variety behind Dallas, what is that? And that now the- uh, Over here? Yeah, what's the right? Aha, I will talk about this later. Um, but oh, I could talk about it right now. This is Oroch. Um, we have the absolute worst luck growing Oroch in our trials. We were gonna include it last year and we didn't get seed in time. Um, and we had seed for this year, but the, let's see, we used, we used 2020 seed for these three beds, which I don't know where Oroch is in here. It's somewhere in the middle. Um, and it, the 2020 seed had really bad germination. I'm not sure what happened. Um, and we used older seed for this bed over here and it is beautiful. Mm. So our data is not gonna be great for Oroch this year, <laughs> unfortunately. But we have a lot of growers growing Oroch um, this year and it looks gorgeous on their farms. Uh, let's see. That's, uh, okay, so yeah, Dracus, Nimbus and Corvus were all uh, also were pretty pretty good. Um, they had good yields and high germination, but they also had pretty high rates of damping off. Um, it is interesting that despite um, the plots losing a lot of plants to damping off, they still had pretty good yields. So clearly the remaining plants were able to bulk up in place of those missing plants. Um, let me just check and make sure I'm not missing saying something. Uh, all three of these are one through 17 varieties, so no gaps there. Um, they, none of them are like particularly upright and be, having a variety be upright is just something that I think of it. People like to have an upright variety that's easy to harvest. Um, if you folks are harvesting with a mechanical harvester, you sometimes like definitely need an upright variety. Um, no wiggle room there. So all three of these were kind of middle of the board, not super upright, not super flat. Um, Corvus was maybe a little flatter than the others. Uh, and then here are some more varieties. These are definitely like not top of the pack best, but they're they're in there. Um, some of them are maybe doing worse than others or better than others. Um, Calusa is is fair, looking fairly flat right now, which isn't great. Um, Kodiak and Laredo both have uh, nice smooth leaves, which is nice, um, and they're both fairly upright. Um, Kodiak was harvested in that first harvest date on December twenty second. And the last time I was in the tunnel on Tuesday, um, its regrowth was looking pretty nice. It's growing back fairly quickly, which is good. Um, Sun Angel is, in my personal opinion, the cutest variety. Um, it has these really nice round leaves. Um, and you can't quite tell in this picture, but it's, um, it's, it was, it's pretty dark green in our tunnel. Um, uh, oh, and I should note, Sun Angel is not a one through 17 variety. It's missing, uh, let's see. See, it's not missing anything totally. And it's, Jim brought this up, but um, it is reported as having intermediate resistance to number 10. Um, yeah, Responder is also one that's not a one through 17 variety. Um, it's missing 13 and 17 there. Um, and Responder had, has a similar like curly leaf situation, similar to Patton and Crosstrek that I mentioned before, um, but slightly worse germination than those two. Um, and then there's Oroch, which I uh, just said my spiel on Oroch. Um, here's a picture of Oroch in uh, one of our growers' tunnels um, from a few weeks ago. Definitely very upright. There's some, um, there's some, what's the caterpillar? There's some caterpillar damage in here. I can't remember what the name is off the top of my head. Um, cutworms. Cutworms, there we go. Thank you, Sue. Um, but definitely lush and, and green and very upright, which is, which is nice and long stems. Are the, are, the cut, are the cutworms a problem when the plants mature, or just when they're young? Both, they they hang out and they're, yeah, they chomp away at it. And they only come out at night, so people often don't know what is eating um, the spinach. Yeah, they make these raggedy holes. Um, oh, Oroch is also not a one through 17 variety, so it's missing 13 and it's missing 17. And we did see um, an outbreak this year on Oroch 
um, that we think is probably 17. Um, yeah. And that was me going to point out the nice looking auroc in the tunnel. But you can definitely see some of the varieties just did not germinate well. This guy over here was a really bad one. That really didn't well. So it's nice to see the comparison of like what good germination could be. <laughs> um, so that brings us to some take homes, a lot of which Jim already said. Um, there's definitely a lot of acceptable varieties out there that are being produced by seed producers. A second question is, are they available to our growers out here? Um, which is a big question. A lot of the varieties that we're trialing this year are not necessarily available through distributors. Um, some of them are. Uh, but if you can't find a 1 through 17 variety that will work for you, definitely the recommendation is don't put all of your eggs in one basket. Grow several different varieties that have different gaps in resistance. Ha ha ha. Mind the gap. Don't plant three varieties that are all susceptible to race 13, because if race 13 shows up on your farm, you're going to lose everything. Um, just plant one variety that has that gap. And then if race 13 arrives, you'll lose one variety and still have two to go. Um, and then some kind of related um, recommendations that aren't necessarily related to downy mildew, but related to spinach production is uh, we're finding more and more that it seems to be quite valuable to take the time to prepare uniform beds. Um, we see a lot of variation in performance of our varieties based on like how wet the soil is or how sunny the bed is, you know, things like that. Um, and it seems to be worth the time to maybe take the time to create a slightly raised bed that um, isn't, doesn't have crazy compaction or lots of variability across the bed and make sure your irrigation is uniform across the tunnel. That seems to have an effect. Um, and I'm actually going to skip that last point there. Um, so I'll end by saying um, this variety trial is part of a larger grant that we're working on um, from SARE. And uh, we are, we would love to hear from more farms and get to work with more farms. So we are looking for growers like you all listening in New England um, who are interested in implementing a new winter spinach production practice whether that is growing a new variety, maybe that has broader downy mildew resistance, or changing up your bed formation technique, or changing up your irrigation or fertilization, anything like that, small or large. Um, and we'll support you with resources and technical support. We'll check in on you over the phone, over email, maybe we'll come visit. Um, and then we're just looking for folks to share their experience with us at the end of the season. Um, and share their thoughts on whether their change practices affected their yield or affected their profitability. Um, so it, I think Lisa is gonna stick a link to a Google form in the chat box. And if you're interested in doing something like that, fill out the Google form with your contact info and we'll get in touch um, and see what we can work on together. And it'd be great to meet some of you all and learn about your spinach production. Um, and lastly, I will just say a huge thanks to Jim and everyone in his lab um, for lots and lots of support that they've given us on this project over the last few years and so much information and sharing and it's can't say thank you enough. Um, and that is all I've got. That's a great. Thank you so much, Jean-Viev. I think that was a lot of what folks were wondering, yeah, which varieties to look for. And some of the questions that are coming in are certainly um, related to where to find the varieties. So I don't know if, and um, also if they're available organically. Um, I don't know if you uh, have uh, any comments about that or if there's anyone um, from the seed companies that wants to chime in here, maybe raise your hand and we can. Um, um, Sue, can I make a couple comments about some of the varieties? Obviously, um, the, the seed companies are developing these hybrids and they're, they're changing almost yearly and there's new varieties coming along, sometimes with the same mildew resistance and so forth. But um, obviously, they're targeting larger markets, California and Arizona and so forth. But uh, these are available directly through the seed company. So if there are particular varieties that people are interested in, I could certainly help facilitate seeing if some seed of that are available. 
you know, in, on the West Coast, you know, they're talking about buying hundreds of bags of seed. One bag of seed is a million seed. I would imagine one or two bags would go a long way in some of the production that you're doing. So some of those varieties, can uh, the seeds available through certain dealers and also can be kept for a while before, you know, it's, it's, it's no longer good from a germination standpoint. But clearly the companies are targeting bigger markets for their more valuable genetics, but that doesn't mean the other, they're not available to, to in smaller quantities. Yeah, we in fact had an example of that just like last week, someone had an outbreak in Maryland and was looking for one of the varieties that John B. have recommended and just got in contact with the producer directly and was able to, to make that connection. I, I think it's just like the, the big producers, um, they don't know that downy mildew, downy mildew is a problem here. So they're just not aware. So it's just bringing the awareness uh, there, um, then it will become easier and easier for seed distributors and seed companies to start carrying some more of these varieties. That's, that's kind of the hope. Um, it's just uh, someone just chimed in from Johnny Seed. My understanding, and again, I I typically deal deal with the larger uh, seed companies de dealing directly with the uh, companies themselves. But I assume that like Johnny Seed is just per they're not actually producing the hybrids. They're just purchasing the seed from directly from the seed company. I assume. Yeah, that's true. Um, really? Just gonna. Julie from Johnny's just raised her hand. So Julie, I allowed you to unmute. If you want to say anything, you're welcome to unmute yourself. All right, can you hear me? Yes, hi. Hi, um, so I'm Julie. I'm the Northeast rep for Johnny Seeds. Um, and I would say that we do, we breed our own um, open pollinated spinach. Um, so all of the hybrid spinach we're bringing in. Um, we have this amazing research technician, um, Rachel Katz, who's running high tunnel trials every year. She's actually running three or four spinach trials every single year at the, the research farm at Johnny's, looking for varieties that perform well in the Northeast. And um, we do, you know, get sort of pre-commercial varieties from breeders as well as trialing things that um, you know that we haven't ever offered before looking at them different times of year and I would say that it's the most challenging crop for for me to work with because it's changing every season and and it's so disappointing because every year there's like a new one in the pipeline that looks so good in the high tunnel and then it turns out that they can't produce seed for it or um, or that it's susceptible in one way or another. So I would say that like, um, as a farmer, it's really frustrating and we see that and we're certainly working really hard. Also knowing that the demands for what we need in the Northeast are pretty much opposite of what they are, is needed <laughs> in California and Arizona. Um, like just seasonally, um, the, the just the growing conditions, even what disease resistance is you need at what time of year, right? Like we need a cladosporium resistant spinach for the winter and they need it for the summer. Um, so th there are a lot of problems and, and all I can say generally speaking is that like we're working hard on it and what you see on our website and catalog are the things, if it says these perform well in a high tunnel, that's based on at least two years of experience um, and that I'm certainly happy to be in touch if you have more specific questions. Um, but I guess all I can say is like, you know, this is something we're really interested in and that takes a lot of work to follow every single year, but we're doing our best. Well, Julie, thank you. Um, so can, if you don't mind, I could, so are, are you producing hybrid seed? Only open pollinated spinach. Only we open don't, pollinated. we don't produce hybrid. Yeah. And where is the farm or your tunnels where you're doing the trials where you're saying you're having uh, the cladosporium issues and so forth? Well, our research farm is in Albion, Maine, oh, um, yeah. but we certainly are in touch with growers across the country. I work just with New England growers. Okay. We and have cladosporium very widely here. So. Yeah, it's been a really bad year for it. I've heard from a bunch of growers. Maybe I'll sh I, I was going to share a few more slides about other issues and I'll just kind of put it up in the background while we're talking. So oh, I'd be interested in getting some of your clad samples if you still have some available. We've got it. We'll send it. Sure. I'll if show you don't you. mind exporting a little bit to Arkansas. <laughs> These are the cutworms that we that we see and this is the cladosporium which is definitely 
possible to come on the seed, so. And uh, Sue, I think, uh, you know, there were some questions about organic seed production. Again, I, that, not my expertise, but that, I know it's fairly limited, at least among some of these more elite varieties or contemporary varieties. Maybe Johnny's doing some seed production organically themselves. I don't know. I'm not sure either. Yeah, we, I mean, we produce organic uh, open pollinated spinach, but not hybrid What spinach. open pollinated varieties are you producing seed of? Just like Bloomsdale, longstanding? And we just released um, a new variety called Equinox mm -hmm. um, that's organic, that's bred by John Navazio. Um, that's sort of an improved um, Bloomsdale type um, and really beautiful. That's been trialed at some farms in Massachusetts and all over Maine. Um, probably no major genes for resistance? No. Mm -hmm. okay. um, were there any other questions in the chat that we didn't get to? I guess um, we talked about a lot about the varieties. Maybe there, there was another seed related question um, uh, from Ken uh, about presence of fusarium in seed coming from Washington. And if um, you guys see that frequently as a problem. I've never seen fusarium in the Northeast. Um, so. Maybe I could just make a couple comments about that. So typically, again, based on my experience in different parts of the country other than East Coast, but typically pre-emergence damping off. Now, uh, uh, Genevieve, you mentioned something about germination. So it's hard to separate that out if you have a poor germ. But typically, if you have good seed, that Pythium and Rhizoctonia will kill the seed before it gets out of the ground. The Fusarium oxysperum will actually, that you'll get a plant, you'll see a dead corpse. It'll kill the plant after it gets out of the ground, so a young plant. Um, so I don't know how much yeah, people can discriminate that, but even though you could find Fusarium oxysperum on spinach seed, the actual incidence of the pathogen on seed is very low. And of course, in Washington State, Lindsay DeToy, she does a lot of work with this pathogen. There are varieties that are planted that have fairly good resistance to fusarium pathogen. So the the, the opportunity that to be that to be on commercial spinach seed is actually fairly low. But under the production conditions on the East Coast and elsewhere, we've seen that biofumigate. Well, if you can't rotate, that biofumigation is a pretty effective for controlling some of these uh, uh, damping off pathogens by incorporating green residue into the soil, particularly in the summertime. That's great. Um, I just want to thank everybody for joining us for this virtual field day. We've, had, we've done a lot of online workshops, but this was the first sort of one that felt like, um, gosh, we would have liked to see the varieties in the field, but, um, I think it was pretty fun and thanks to our, all of our presenters. Thanks to Jim and Kelly. Thank you so much. Traveling you. this great distance. <laughs>